Being spirit-filled is centered upon a continual process of spiritual growth and maturity that can only be found and cultivated by the Spirit of God. By submitting to this process, we glorify the Lord Jesus Christ in word and deed while being conformed to His image through the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling within and filling us continually. Being spirit-filled applies to believers in Christ, understanding that the fruit of the Spirit will be found in the life of a believer, Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23. This is a daily submission as we walk with the Lord in progressive sanctification, yielding to the Holy Spirit and being filled for His glory and being empowered for proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. You just heard an excerpt from my latest blog post featured on Love Sick Scribe. Hi there, and welcome to the Love Sick Scribe podcast, where we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. I am Dawn Hill, and I am the Love Sick Scribe. Spirit filled without tongues. This is what we're talking about today. We're going to be covering a lot of ground today as far as scripture. So I'm not going to make any apologies for that. If you're a Christian, you need to love the word of God because you love the one who is the word, right? Now, I received a number of comments and messages about this post. Overall, the the dialogue was good. There were a lot of people that shared on there from their personal experiences. They shared their thoughts on there. As believers in Christ, they were encouraged by the post. Some people were discouraged by the post. And what I would want to say is this, just to start out, is that we as believers in Christ and in general as human beings, we should not be afraid to talk about difficult topics or topics that are controversial or topics that could cause people to disagree with us. But as Christians, we should be taking these things back to Scripture. And we need to to be willing to have the conversations, the tough conversations, the uncomfortable conversations, and be willing to be respectful and humble and gentle with people while steering back to what Scripture has to say in context. And as a believer, I just want to share this as well. And this is something that is helping me every day to grow in maturity in Christ. My experiences, once again, are not the filter through which I understand the truth. We are to filter everything through scripture, including our experiences, and to make sure that they are aligning with what the Bible has to say about things if we are if we're believers in Christ professing believers in Christ now I shared a little bit on my post about the teaching that being spirit-filled is evident with speaking in tongues that is the whole premise of that post by the way I just want to lay that out at the very beginning because I don't want people thinking that I'm coming after your prayer language that I'm judging people that use a prayer language that has nothing to do with that rather what I wanted to do was to share a little bit about the experience I had and how I had to fill filter it through scripture. And the the teaching that I was taught for years was this, you're not spirit filled until you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And you don't know that you have that until that's, you have the evidence of speaking in tongues. And I talked a little bit about that. I'm not going to go into the personal things I talked about in there. You can read that on the blog post. I really want to focus more on scripture today because that is the, that is the foundation on which we are to stand when we again, bring our experiences back to proper understanding. Typically, when that's talked about, as as what I was taught in the charismatic church, is that your private prayer language is one of the four distinct occurrences of tongues in Scripture that is talked about sometimes. Some people teach that there's four distinct ones, others do not. But some people will talk about and they'll focus and hone in and they'll even use passages like Acts 2, they'll use passages... Um, in Acts 10 and such, when they'll say that people were filled with the Spirit, that they spoke in tongues, but they won't read the rest of the passage. Now, not everybody does this, but the, the teaching that I was under, the the verses were used, misappropriated, out of context, and they were not fully read. And so some of the b- passages were actually used to support the, the evidence of a private prayer language, when really when we read it in context, that's not what was occurring in these passages of Scripture. And we need to be upfront about that. And again, if you hold a private prayer language, I want to say this. I said this in the post. I'm going to say it on the podcast. I'm not here to make an assault or attack a private prayer language. What the whole premise of this podcast is, is that a believer in Christ is spirit filled and the scripture supports that and they do not have to speak in tongues to provide that evidence. 
Scripture does not support that, but it does support the fact that believers in Christ are spirit filled, and we're going to look. We're going to look at numerous passages in Scripture that support this, that show us what happened. First of all, when people did speak in tongues, when the occurrences in Scripture when that happened, and what took place after that happened. We're also going to look at the passages when it says, well, when a person was filled with the Spirit, what happened after that? Was it tongues every time consistently? We're going to talk about what it truly means to be filled with the Spirit, according to scripture. And so I hope that this podcast is going to help bring some clarity to some people. It's not going to be to judge anyone. It's not going to be to attack anyone. I never want to do that. Even though it does feel like that sometimes when we have someone that is negating what we believe, our first instinct is to attack it or to feel defensive and to put those defenses up and to not want to listen or to hear what what is being said or to misconstrue it and think, well, they're they're just not spirit filled. They're just missing out. We just have to be respectful when we're talking to one another and that we're ultimately glorifying God when we do so, that we're wanting to glorify him and not ourselves and to try to be right in our own sight, but that we have proper understanding based in scripture. So this is what I was taught. I was taught that you were only spirit filled unless you spoke in tongues. And it almost creates, I didn't ever realize this, until after coming out and looking at scripture, but it creates a hierarchy. It it creates a chasm really between these people that have the spirit and those that don't have. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, be jumping into the scripture. And again, before I do that, along with understanding, I'm not making assault here on tongues. I want to say this. If you hold to a private prayer language and you hold to the core tenets of Christianity, meaning Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. He's the son of God, truly God, truly man. He came to earth. He died. He died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again in three days. He sits at the right hand of the father. He is uh, the high priest. He propiti- He propitiated for our sins. He's the only way to the father through uh, repentance and faith in Christ alone by his grace that's, that's given to us for eternal life. Then I. I consider you a fellow believer in Christ, and this is not a primary issue, though there are some in the charismatic church that will make speaking in tongues a primary issue, and they will say, you're not spirit-filled unless you speak in tongues. I have to appeal to scripture on this. Well, what does the Bible have to say about this? Because it's the fin- the Bible has the final say because it's God speaking. God is giving us his word to help us to provide proper instruction. With that being said, let us open our Bibles and begin to look first at the occurrences in Acts, for example, when when people were filled with the Spirit and the evidence of speaking in tongues came. We see three instances of this in the Acts of the Apostles. We see this happen first in Acts 2, verse 4, when it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. As we read on, we see what happened here. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of the Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And I want you to notice something. When this happened on the day of Pentecost, it says that they were in the upper room. They were praying in one accord. They were all together, the 120. And that tongues of fire came upon them. There was a sound of a mighty rushing wind. The tongues of fire came in, came upon them. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, this is not a private prayer language. And I know that some people are going to try to use that scripture in such a way. And this was used as um, a foundation for the private prayer language in the teaching I was part of. But this is not talking in context. This cannot be a private prayer language because we see as we read on from verse 5 through 11 that these were tongues that were known in the earth, unknown to those who were speaking them, and that there were interpretations given because there were interpreters there that understood there were 16 nations listed that understood what was going on. On the day of Pentecost, they recognized it. These were Jews from all these different nations that heard this. They had come to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. And they were hearing these people telling of the mighty works of God in their own tongues. And they were bewildered by this. 
Now, there are some that actually teach when the tongues came to these the Jewish people here that this was a sign of judgment because of Isaiah 28, verse 11, which is referenced, by the way, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, when it talks about that tongues are a sign for the unbeliever. And we're going to talk a little bit about 1 Corinthians 14. For time's sake, we may not be able to get into all of that, but we are going to touch on some of that for our understanding so that we can see what's going on there. But we can see here in Acts 2, this was a miraculous thing that happened. And honestly, you know, some people are going to pull out Mark 16, 15 through 18, and they're going to say, well, you know, those that believe they're going to speak with new tongues. Well, I would argue that if we are going to include this passage, which is not a salvation issue, by the way, if you hold to Mark 16, 15 through 18, whether it was um, originally there and was said by God or whether it was added by a scribe, irregardless of that, Believing Mark 16, excuse me, Mark 16, 15 through 18 is not a salvation issue. Your salvation is not based on believing that. Your salvation is based on believing in Christ to save you and to um, give you eternal life through faith in him for the salvation of your sins. So if you do hold to that, then I would argue that this actually did come to pass. These disciples that Jesus was speaking to did in fact fulfill what happened in speaking new tongues in Acts 2. The new tongues they were speaking in, they did not know. They were known languages in the earth, but they didn't know them. They were given that supernaturally by the Holy Spirit, and they were testifying of God. This was not something that was unintelligible. They were not praying to themselves or praying to God. This was a sign for unbelievers. We see 3,000 souls come to the kingdom after this happened, and what followed the tongues? Peter ministers. He preaches the sermon to them on Pentecost, and he calls them to repent after they ask, what must we do? He tells them what they must do. Repent and be baptized. This is in verse 30. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off and everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. My goodness, if Peter had only recognized that he was actually ministering later on, it would have made more sense to him in Acts 10 that he was ministering, telling of the the coming salvation that would come to the Gentiles as well as we will see in a few minutes for Acts 10. So we're seeing here the first evidence that we see people actually speaking in tongues in Scripture is, and when we read it in context... We're seeing that these are known languages, unknown to the speaker, but they were translated, interpreted by those around them. They were assigned to the unbeliever. The gospel was ministered. They were filled. Now, when you look at the Greek word, several times you see this Greek word, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. Uh, The Greek word used for filled in Acts 2, in Acts 10, uh, Acts 4, uh, Acts 5. There's several different places there when you look at the word filled in the Greek. That word is used in such a way that it, it seems to imply a single event taking place that you're being empowered for a work of service. So every time a person was filled, according to what the Bible instructs us in the Acts of the Apostles, for example, and even in, the, in Luke, let me remind you, uh, when you look at Luke one fifteen, when you look at when Elizabeth was filled, uh, when you look at when Zechariah was full of the Holy Spirit. When you look at John the Baptist will be filled with the Spirit. That same word is used there. And it means empowered for a work of service. The second time that we see tongues mentioned is in Acts 10. So we're going to turn there. This is when the gospel came to the Gentiles. Peter, we know, received an open vision um, when he was on the rooftop during the day. He saw the cloth come down, the white cloth, with all the clean and unclean animals in it three times. And he essentially received the revelation from God. He didn't understand it at the time, but that the gospel was coming to the Gentiles, which the Gentiles would have been known as being unclean to the Jewish people. Peter goes to the house of Cornelius because he's summoned there by people that are sent by Cornelius, and he begins to minister the gospel to them. We see that the gospel is ministered. We can see this in verse 34. Um, It says that Gentiles hear the good news. Uh, Verse 34, so Peter opened his mouth and said, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed 
oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed to God and to to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Folks, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ being ministered to the house of Cornelius at that moment. The Gentiles were receiving the gospel. And what happened after this? While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word, and the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. Now, just as a side note, it doesn't say they were filled, but we do see that the Holy Spirit is being poured out on them. For verse 46 says, for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. These witnesses of, with Peter were understanding these people that were having the Holy Spirit poured out on them because they were extolling God. Again, not a prayer language. And how do we know it's not a prayer language? Because when we read in Acts 11, when Peter is before the council, he is getting rebuked by the council for going to minister to the Gentiles. But Peter helps them to understand here, this was a sign essentially to unbelievers, meaning the council. It's not that they didn't believe in Christ, but they did not believe that the Gentiles could be saved. So what happens in verse 15, it says, as I began to speak, this is Peter speaking, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God saying, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. So not a private prayer language that we just see, but we see that when they, the spirit came upon them, we see that tongues came upon them, they were speaking in tongues, and they were extolling God. And Peter makes it clear that the Holy Spirit fell on them just as he did on them at the beginning. He's referring to Acts 2. He's referring to the day of Pentecost. And he's making it clear it's the same manifestation, which is they were speaking languages they could not have known naturally, that they had not learned, but that the Holy Spirit supernaturally gave them this sign in essence, to Peter and to the witnesses so they could go back and tell the council, yes, the same thing that happened to us at the day of Pentecost has happened to the Gentiles. And this helped the council to see salvation has come to the Gentiles as well because the same thing happened in Acts 2. Do you see how God sets the pattern up there to where to help, uh, to help them at that time to understand? Because remember, it's written to them in the first century. Luke is writing this to Theophilus, and it's a historical account in the Acts of the Apostles to help them to help Theophilus and those who read to see what happened in the first century at the at the beginning, the early beginnings of the church, and what happened with the gospel being preached by the apostles to lay the foundation for the New Testament church. So we're seeing here God strategically and uh, deliberately had this happen, the same manifestation to authenticate that, yes, the Gentiles had been granted salvation. And the council, their response is, to the Gentiles, God has also granted repentance that leads to life. This wasn't about a supernatural manifestation. It wasn't about a higher ascension or a higher level of spirituality. This was about recognizing that the gospel had come to the Gentiles. So, Let's not beat a dead horse any longer. The last one that we're going to go to is Acts 19. That is the third occurrence that we see in the New Testament where tongues are mentioned that they happen. And we'll see this with Paul as he is in Ephesus. And it begins in verse 1 that he was with Apollos at Corinth. He passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. And he found some disciples there. And as we continue to read through there, we find that these are not disciples of Christ. These are disciples of John the Baptist. So they are not believers. They have heard of the water baptism, the baptism of John, which leads to repentance, but they're still waiting on the Messiah. So Paul says to them, uh, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. So Paul tells them in verse four, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him. That is Jesus. On hearing this, 
listen to this again, and I hope you have your Bibles open. I just want to remind you, if you need to pause it for a moment, open your Bibles, please, and read along with me. Do not take what I am saying at face value. Always, 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 whether you're listening to a pastor of a church or you're listening to anyone that's opening up the Bible, open up your Bible and read along. Do not believe, just do not take at face value what someone is saying. Make sure that you are a student of the word yourself. I cannot express that enough to you. In verse 4, when he says, John baptized with baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was come at, who was to come after him, that is Jesus. And on verse 5, listen, on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So we can assume that they received forgiveness for their sins and and eternal life, essentially. They were baptized in John's baptism, but now they're receiving eternal life through Christ. Now listen to this. And when Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. And there were about 12 men in all. I know that some people are going to mention, I will say this about the private prayer language. There is the talk of there's a, there's a second baptism, which when we look in 1 Corinthians, we look in Ephesians 4, it, it, it seems to make it clear that there's only one baptism, um, that we're, we're only baptized into one Lord, one baptism, one spirit. But yet, in, there's a teaching that there is a second baptism, which is in the Holy Spirit. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but when I read this in Acts 19, if I were to deduce that the baptisms were needed, it almost seems like there's three baptisms mentioned here because there's John's baptism, and then there's the baptism in Christ that's mentioned here in verse 5 when they just heard Paul didn't touch them. Nothing supernaturally happened with this. Ex well, I should say something did supernaturally happen. They received eternal life through Christ. So let, let me correct myself on that. So but on verse 5, it says, On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. But they weren't manifesting tongues at that point, not until Paul laid hands on them. And then they started speaking in tongues and prophesying. So sometimes people tend to think all prophecy is is foretelling. Prophecy is not just foretelling, like we see in Scripture with the telling of the coming Messiah in the Old Testament. Prophecy is also forthtelling. Prophecy is the gospel. It's ministering the Word of God. That is prophecy. We can see here that they obviously understood what they were saying because they recognized that they were prophesying. This is, again, not a private prayer language that we can see that they are speaking in tongues. And Luke wrote this letter. So some people will say, well, we can use some of these passages to say about particular beliefs because he doesn't specify that this is what's happening. The logic would tell us that if Luke is writing this letter, if he said something in Acts 2, and it's consistently the same thing throughout the whole letter, there's no need for Luke to reiterate over and over and over again, hey, this is the same thing that happened in Acts, which we know that that was made clear in Acts 10 because of the reason of the Gentiles. We're seeing here that Luke is writing this to Theophilus, and it would make sense that when he says speaking in tongues after he's already made it clear what it is in two other passages, that it's the same manifestation happening in Acts 19. So we can see here these three occurrences where tongues are mentioned as taking place in the Acts of the Apostles. Now, when we look at uh, 1 Corinthians 14, when you look at Corinthians as a whole, 1 Corinthians in particular, you're going to notice a pattern. And what the pattern is, is that Paul is rebuking and bringing correction to the Corinthian church because they're doing a lot of things out of order. They're receiving communion improperly. The rich people were having no regard for the poor people and they were treating it as a meal and getting drunk. You're seeing that there are people suing one another. You're seeing sexual immorality in the church. You're seeing a lot of things that are taking place. Um, there's divisions that are coming about um, in Corinthians that Paul is trying to rectify that and trying to point them back to Christ and not just to a certain person. You see in 2 Corinthians, for example, that Paul is having to address the super apostles because the super apostles these other apostles had come in, they were greedy and they were taking people's money and Paul is reminding them what a true apostle is and their stance and their position in being a servant of Christ and, their, and how they serve the gospel and how they serve the people, the church. Paul spends a lot of time in the Corinthians and 1st and 2nd Corinthians bringing a lot of correction to the church. And in 12, 13, and 14 in 1 Corinthians, he talks about the spiritual gifts, which um, I do actually want to back up for just a second to 1 Corinthians 12. When we look at the spiritual gifts, we see that he lays them out. He talks about the body, about how, um, you know, essentially talking about the importance of every person in the body coming together, that not, not one part is more significant than the other, that one cannot work without the other, that we're focusing on coming back to being one with God. 
And I don't mean that in a way of us being God, but us reminding who we are to serve, to whom we belong, and that we're not an island in and of ourselves serving and being superior over somebody else. Because it looks like when you read in 1 Corinthians 14, as we'll get there in just a few minutes, that it it appears that Paul is bringing correction to the Corinthian church, in essence, in 1 Corinthians 14, because they were exalting the gift of tongues over every other gift. And anybody who spoke in tongues whether it was intelligible or not, they were exalting that gift above everything else and also almost making it as if it was a superior a manifestation if you if you had such a gift. But in 1 Corinthians 12, we see near the end of this chapter that Paul is asking a series of questions. Now, I'm not a Bible scholar. I don't know Greek, and I'm not a theologian. But I have actually listened to some teachings on this, and when some that are, are very well versed in Greek and know Greek and teach it, they talk about at the end with all these series of questions that these questions are in the negative, which means that the answer to these questions would be no, that these are not the case when Paul asks these questions. So when he says, are all apostles? The answer is no. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Do all work miracles? No. Do all possess gifts of healing? No. Do all speak with tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you still a more excellent way. And the more excellent way is love. You see in verse in First Corinthians thirteen that he talks about love, the importance of love, how that's sandwiched in between the spiritual gifts and then understanding tongues and prophecy, and that the gifts are for edifying the body. Let me make let me also point that out as well, just as something else to kind of think about and put a pebble in your shoe. I love that statement. It's not my statement. It's somebody else's. Here's a pebble for your shoe. OK, or a couple of pebbles. First off in this in, in verse 30, it says, do all speak with tongues? The answer is no. Now, some people will try to say, well, that's not talking. That's talking about those that speak in languages. Well, tongues are languages. That's the actual definition of tongues is, is glossa is the Greek word. And it's actual tongues. It's, it's languages. When it says that all speak with tongues, the answer is no. All, peop- all do not speak with tongues, nor do all interpret. So th- this scripture should be encouraging for those that have never had their own prayer language or been able to speak in tongues. And, and let me just preface it by saying this. You know, God could do anything. He could certainly use a missionary in another country to minister and to supernaturally give them the language of, of in, in Vietnam or in the remote parts of Africa and give them the specific language of a tribe and glorify God and the gospel could come to them. Could that happen? Sure, because God can do anything. But I would argue that that is the actual gift of tongues. That is what's demonstrated in Scripture consistently when you see the gift of tongues. So no, not everybody speaks in tongues. And 1 Corinthians 12 makes that clear that with tongues, which are languages, that's the definition for that, not all speak in tongues. And that that could be that should be very freeing to us. And then even in First Corinthians 13, um, another thing that's mentioned too. Some people will say, well, you know, prayer language is the uh, along the lines with tongues of angels, because Paul mentions that about, you know, speaking in the tongues of men or tongues of angels, which some people uh, believe when they read this, uh, that Paul is speaking in a hyperbolic state because he talks about if I have all faith as to remove mountains, but if not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, if I if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love. I gain nothing. It would seem that he's creating a pattern here of talking in a hyperbolic state. So we don't really know for certain if there are actual tongues of angels or if Paul is speaking in a hyperbolic state here to exaggerate the point. And some people would say, and I'm going to argue this point too, and just, or not argue, but again, another little pebble I'll add to your shoe. If there are tongues of angels, and if the, the language, the private prayer language is in fact in the tongues of angels, It's a heavenly prayer language that we can't mess up, but Satan can't understand it. Then I would like someone to help me understand now, how can the devil not understand it when he was an angel in heaven? We go on to 1 Corinthians 14. We're going to see again that Paul is bringing instruction and correction and order back to the Corinthian church when dealing with tongues. And when looking at 1 Corinthians 14, Paul is encouraging and admonishing really the the Corinthian church that the gifts he's reminding them are for the building of the church. They're not for personal use. They're not for personally building ourselves up. 
Now, what's interesting is, is that when you think about the gift of tongues, as far as when, when I told you about it in the blog post that I did, and some may relate to this, is that, that there's a teaching of the, the private prayer language. Another pebble I want to add to your shoe to think about is, why is that the only gift that's focused on to build up self, whereas there's no other gifts that are used that we see to, to build up self necessarily And that really contradicts scripture because scripture tells us that the spiritual gifts are not for building up self as what Paul is trying to help them understand because he says, you know, the one who prophesies builds up the church, the one who speaks in tongues builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church, if he's building up himself where no one can understand it, which is the context here, then it's not doing any good. It's in vain. And the, the gifts are for building up the church. That was the point of the gifts. So let's move on to verse six. So he says, now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching. If even lifeless instruments such as the flute or the harp do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So with yourselves, if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Again, we're not supposed to be building up self as sometimes is taught with with the tongues as far as some people that believe that in the charismatic church of it being a prayer language to build yourself up and not using it in context of what this is, which is speaking in tongues miraculously in a language that you have never been taught and could not know naturally speaking, but has supernaturally been gifted to you by the Holy Spirit, which we cannot activate or impart or will gifts to happen. It, the scripture is clear in 1 Corinthians 12 that the Holy Spirit is the one who gives gifts as he wills. So, I hate to break it to you, but those that are paying for webinars, for those that are going to conferences and such, and you think you're getting gifts activated because some specific person is laying their hands on you, that's not biblical. No one can activate these gifts in you. The spiritual gifts are given by the Holy Spirit as he wills, and they are in accordance with scripture. And it's also clear too, when Paul is speaking to them, it seems like when you're reading this, that he's correcting the misuse of tongues in corporate gatherings that the Corinthians were doing. It sounds as if that they were using unintelligible language and they were using it in a superior way to say, well, I pray in tongues or speak in tongues. And it wasn't being used to edify the church. It was just being used to show more spirituality. It's, it's what is seeming when you read the scriptures here. And he's reminding the Corinthian believers that just as lifeless instruments make distinct notes, if they don't have the note that they're supposed to play, how will anyone know what is played? Or if the bugle makes a distinct sound, who, how are they going to get ready for battle if it doesn't make that distinct sound? And so he reminds them, you know, with yourselves, if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? Now, another thing to, to point out here, and I will say this just from services that I was in, and there were many services that over, you're talking almost two decades of being in services and conferences. Uh, we practically lived at the church a lot of times, <laughs> and that's kind of an exaggeration, but we were, it was not uncommon for us um, to be at the church, you know, four out of seven days a week sometimes for different reasons and to serve in different capacities. So that was not uncommon. And sometimes it could be more than that, especially if there were conferences going on and and other things like that, that were affiliated with the, the church. One thing that was very prevalent in the movement that I was in, and I participated in this and have repented of this because of acknowledging that this was not a biblical practice, is that there were times we were encouraged by the minister or whoever was on the microphone or in intercessory prayer, you know, different different capacities, worship settings and such. There were people that encouraged, including myself, we encouraged people to pray or to sing out in the spirit all together. And there was no interpretation. And as we read through 1 Corinthians 14, we're going to find that that is not a biblical practice, that there is order to worship and that two or three 
Actually, I'll show you this in verse 26. We'll skip down a minute. Uh, what then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or three, at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in the church and speak to himself and to God. So notice here, there, the guidelines are, are clear here that in corporate times, if there was a tongue given, it was only to be one at a time and to be interpreted. So whether intelligible or unintelligible language in a corporate gathering and encouraging people to do it all together is not in accordance with scripture. That actually brings confusion and it's chaotic as we're going to see as we read on through here. We'll go back up to verse 13. Verse 13, therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray for the power to interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. Now notice here, how Paul is talking. Therefore, in verse 13 is referring to what just preceded and not speaking in an unintelligible language in a corporate gathering because the, the gifts were for building up the church, not for building up self. And he goes on in verse 14, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So he's reminding them again that your spirit and your mind need to be working together in praying and in worshiping God. So then he says, verse 15, what am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God. Now, this is another passage that's misconstrued and taken out of context. And notice here that Paul does not say that he prays in tongues more than anyone else. He says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. And also something else to note, there is never any mention in scripture of Paul ever speaking in tongues. Now, we know here that he did. But there's no account recorded of that in scripture, which is interesting. Nevertheless, in church, verse 19. I, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. So again, he is telling them, and it seems like here that he is making um, a distinction and telling them it's better for you to prophesy. It's better for you to have, and if you're going to speak in tongues here, the, the proper gift of the actual, the biblical gift of tongues that we see even outlined in Acts then the way to do that is to make sure that there is an interpreter because this gift is for building up the church. It's for, it's for the unbeliever. We're going to see this as we move on past verse 19 into verse 20. But we're seeing here that Paul is making it clear that with, for building up the church, there needs to be proper understanding. There needs to be proper order. There needs to be instruction given in order in, for, that, for the people to understand it. Because if they don't understand it, there's no building up the church. There's no edifying and there's no glorifying Christ in that essentially. Verse 20, brothers, do not be children in your thinking, be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. He is referencing Isaiah chapter 28, verse 11 and 12, which I talked about earlier and about what, what that meant. You can refer back to that. Verse 22, thus tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. While prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. If therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your minds? So he's again, he's pointing out that there needs to be order here. There is an order to this and that, that needs to be honored in the church. And actually tongues were for the unbelievers, meaning that when you see this ministered in Acts also, they were not in actual corporate, quote unquote, corporate church settings, which a lot of times they met in small homes and things like that. But you see the ministering of the sign, the biblical sign of tongues, it's happening outside the church. It's happening outside the, the, the quote, four walls, what we would talk about. You're, and you're seeing it to unbelievers. The signs are for unbelievers to in essence, to point them back to Christ and to minister, to, to preach the gospel to them. 
If therefore the whole church comes together, as we said, all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your minds? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all the secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. And again, prophecy goes back to also forth telling, preaching of the gospel, calling a, rep- a call to repentance from sin, turning from sin, turning to Christ, having your faith in Christ. Christ alone to salve you, to save you and to give you eternal life. So that's a brief look at 1 Corinthians 14. I know that we could go in far greater depths with that. There are theologians that have gone into that. There is debate on 1 Corinthians 14, what certain passages mean. Certain people will use passages in there to refute the fact that there uh, is not a prayer language. They will say it actually uh, alludes to that in some passages. Some people say no, that that's not what it is. And I just wanted to cover the general basics of it and to read it in context. Now, when we look at what it means to be filled with the Spirit, which is the main focus of this, and we can't really talk about being filled without covering those passages and trying to bring some sort of clarity to what's going on there. So when we talk about being Spirit-filled, is speaking in tongues always a result of being filled with the Spirit? I found this great article on blueletterbible.org. It's written by a gentleman named Don Stewart. It's under the study resources. And these were actually some scriptures I had found in my own private time uh, studying. And before finding this article, I encourage you to look at this article on blueletterbible.org. It's called, Is Speaking in Tongues Always a Result of Being Filled with the Spirit? And it's he's asked, answering these uh, series of questions about the Holy Spirit in us. And so he talks about Acts 2 in here. He talks about... Acts 10 with Cornelius and Acts 19, as we've already talked about, which uh, it was really good to read this because it was uh, affirming to, to know as, as you're reading along that you're finding these things in Scripture. And so he talks about speaking in tongues is the exception, not the rule. Uh, when we talk about being filled with the Spirit, some things to think about are this, is that when we see in the passages, as I mentioned before, such as in Luke, I did a little study on this in a concordance and was trying to find the words filled, for example, and and trying to find some cross references to this. And, and then also I found this article as well. And I thought, oh, this is really neat. I found this article that affirms again what, what I was finding in the concordance and matching up. So you find, as I mentioned before, you find in the gospel, according to Luke, you find mentions uh, mentionings of being filled with the spirit in Luke chapter one, verse 41 through 45. Uh, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the same Greek word there that is used in Acts for the empowerment for the work of service. And what happened when Elizabeth was filled with the Spirit? Did she speak in her in a prayer language? Nope. She cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what has been spoken to her by the Lord. Elizabeth is exhorting Mary and testifying of Christ. And, and helping, encouraging her in the Lord about the baby that's in her womb who would be the Savior, the Messiah. So she was filled with the Spirit. There is no evidence of talking in a private prayer language or having to speak in tongues in that moment. Another example is found in Luke chapter 1, verse 67 with Zechariah. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Spirit and prophesied. So again, we're seeing filling of the Spirit for a pa- empowerment for work of service, typically a single event that is taking place. And what follows after that being filled with the Spirit, this pattern is consistent through Scripture, is that there is a ministering of the gospel, testifying of Christ, pointing back to God or exalting Him and magnifying Him in His mighty works. It's all about Christ. It is Christ-centered. <laughs> so we're seeing this here that Zechariah begins to prophesy here. And he's not speaking in a private prayer language. Again, I am not attacking the prayer language. I just want to make that clear here. I am merely showing you the fact of the consistency in scripture that shows that being spirit filled is not equated to speaking in tongues. But when you're going to say that someone that's born again does not speak in tongues and hence they're not spirit filled, the burden is on you to prove that in scripture and to do it in proper context. And when we don't honor God with the proper context of scripture. We bring reproach on the name of Christ and we are not testifying of the true gospel of Jesus Christ and we're not glorifying God in doing so. And when we create divisions in the church and saying, well, I'm spirit filled and 
I may not truly believe this, but somehow I'm insinuating that I'm superior because I speak in tongues or pray in tongues and I have this language and, and I'm making it the case that you can't be spirit filled unless you do this. I would argue then that's becoming a works-based type religion. It's becoming a works-based type of relationship where if you don't do this, then you're not really, you really don't have a relationship with God. If you don't do this, this, and this, then you really don't know God really well. And that is bordering on works-based religion, works-based in relationship. And again, our relationship is not based on our work. It is based on the finished work of Christ on the cross. And when he finished it, he, and by the way, it is finished, regardless of what anybody says, he does not need our help to finish anything. Christ finished it. It's done. What the, he did, he came to, to settle the victory, to settle the debt that we paid for our sins, for the wrath of God that we deserved. And he became the propitiation for that sin. He atoned for that sin. And those who would come to faith in him, who would be drawn by the father to him and would come to faith in him through Christ alone, by grace, through faith in Christ alone. They are the recipients of being co-heirs with Christ in a here and not yet type of state and given eternal life through faith in him alone. The moment of salvation the Holy Spirit comes to indwell you. He will be with you. John 14, 16, Jesus said that he would go to the Father and he would ask that he would send the advocate to to us, the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of truth, and that he would be with us for. Ever. He would be with his disciples forever. He's with us as forever as believers. He, and God has not left us and, and forsaken us. His spirit indwells us. It is not Jesus who indwells us. It is the Holy Spirit who indwells us. And we honor, we glorify Christ when we testify by the Holy Spirit. We are testifying of Christ because the Holy Spirit testifies of Christ. And Jesus made that clear also in the Gospels that the Holy Spirit would testify of him, i.e. Jesus Christ. Christ. The Holy Spirit never draws attention to himself. If you're in um, a, in a setting or an atmosphere where it's always a focus on the Holy Spirit and drawing attention to him and what he wants to do and giving permission, which I've talked about that at nauseum, and focusing on the Holy Spirit and everything that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, we need to step back for a moment and see who is being, uh, who the focus is, and if it's the, truly the Holy Spirit that's that's ministering, because the Holy Spirit is going to point back to Jesus Christ every time. The next example we see is Jesus, actually, in Luke chapter 4, verse 1, we see in Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Jesus was filled with the Spirit. He was he was led to be tempted by the devil. There is no record of Jesus ever speaking in tongues. Um, I know I've had some conversations about this with people, and some people may point to the fact of in certain passages where he's praying over the the little girl that died, and he's saying Talitha Kumi. Uh, to my understanding, when I look at some of the uh, study Bibles that I have, that is actually Aramaic, so that is a language that was known to the Jewish people. They would have recognized that. Uh, the second. Uh, example is when he is on the cross and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He also says that in Aramaic. There are some uh, study Bibles that note that some of it is in Hebrew and, and some of it is in Aramaic, but nevertheless, we see that that is in Aramaic. And we know that the uh, New Testament was written in Greek. So why would they make that distinction? I don't know why they would, why Jesus would say that in that language, but we do know that that was a common language. Aramaic was a common language that Jesus spoke and the Jews spoke it. And the Jews there would have heard him say that the Roman guards would not have understood that. That was not a language that they spoke to my understanding. Now, if I'm wrong about that, someone can please message me about that. But this was a common language of the Jews in that time, and they would have recognized what Jesus was saying. And what is even, it's even more fascinating, he's quoting from Psalm 22 when he says that. And Psalm 22, that's worth doing actually a study on sometime and looking at, and looking at it and breaking it down. There are several references in Psalm 22. Really, the book of Psalms is testifying of Christ all the way through and through and prophesying of him and uh, giving a, a, and alluding to the crucifixion and things that are happening with Christ. But you can look at that clearly and see he is referencing Psalm 22 and the Jews there would have heard him say it and they would have recognized it. So that's just something to kind of point out there too. Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit here. He's empowered for a work of service and he is going to be tempted by the devil and he's going to have victory over the devil. 
Peter was filled with the Spirit in Acts chapter 4, verse 8. Uh, and he, after they had healed the lame man, uh, the, the lame man that was begging, that was lame for pretty much practically his whole life, he, they went before the council. He and John did. And Peter, it says, filled with the Holy Spirit, again, did not speak in tongues before the council. What he did, he was filled for and, and empowered for a work of service in that single event. And he began to preach to them and he called them to repentance. He ministered the gospel to them. The early church in Acts chapter 4, verse 31, when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. So again, there is no reference to speaking in tongues here. They were filled. They were filled for a work of service. And what happened after that? They spoke the word of God with boldness. They were empowered to speak the word of God with boldness and without fear. Stephen Acts chapter 7, verse 55, he was full of the Holy Spirit. He gazed into heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. There's no record of him speaking in tongues there. He is full of the Holy Spirit. He administered. And because of what he administered, he was stoned for that, for the gospel. So these are some great examples here for us to get a good understanding of what does it mean to be spirit filled? What what examples can we see in scripture that help us to understand this better? What it looks like to truly be spirit filled and what happens after being spirit filled. Now, one other scripture I'm going to point you to and I know this is a long podcast, but stay with me. And if you love the word, then you're really probably enjoying this and I love the word too. I love subjects like this. I could talk about them as you can see forever. <laughs> but I'm not going to do that. We see in Ephesians 5.18, I want you to, I want to point this out to you, and this can also coincide with Colossians 3.16. Uh, they can go hand in hand when you look at this. So one thing that we can see along with Galatians 5, when we look at the fruit of the Spirit, being Spirit-filled is not just being empowered for a work of service. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit to testify of Christ, to minister the gospel. We cannot testify of Christ without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We, we simply cannot do that. But the Holy Spirit also continues to do a work in us. In Ephesians 5.18, we see this passage mentioned. And actually, I'm going to back up and just read verse uh, 17. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So when you read Ephesians 5 in context, I encourage you to go back just for time's sake. I'm not going to, but when you go back and read Ephesians 5 in context, you're going to notice something very interesting. Paul makes the distinction here. He he draws a dichotomy between those that are sons of disobedience, son, so, those that serve in the, the world, that they are doing things that are done in darkness, that we're uh, believers are to take no part in those unfruitful works, but they are instead to expose them because it's shameful to even speak of the things that they do and, in, in secret. And that when those things are exposed by the light, it becomes visible and essentially we want to to minister to those in darkness and expose those things to light not to bring shame but to to cry for repentance and to minister the gospel to them to awaken them from their death from the slumber of death that they are in and they're dead in their trespasses and to call them to everlasting life in Christ. He's making that dichotomy here in Ephesians 5 and he's showing these are the ones that are sons of disobedience, that they live in darkness and they do these things that are excesses in the world. They live in debauchery. They are getting drunk. They're doing things in dissipation. They're doing excessive things that are worldly and they're not pleasing to God. By the way, Ephesians 5.18 is not a proof text for getting drunk in the spirit. And I'm going to do a time Topic on that at some other point and talk about that. Lord, help me on that as well. Um, that was, was also something I had, I have experience with in the, the movement that I was part of. Something else I've repented of as well. So that's another, I like to say this, another topic for another day. In context, this is showing the difference between excessively living on the world and focusing on those things that are not honoring God versus those that are filled with the Spirit. It's a continual process. When you look up this Greek word, it is not the same Greek word that's in Acts. It's the completely different one. And what it means is it's a continual process, and it points to spiritual growth and maturity. That's what it's talking about, spiritually being mature. And this is also talking in the setting of a corporate gathering. So you come together, you're filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and 
and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is Christ-centered. There is no possibility when you are a true mature believer in Christ and you're focused on exalting God and magnifying Him in your private time, in your life, in your day-to-day life, in your workplace, in in ministering to others through and serving them. That's, That's ministry as well and serving in um, developing and cultivating the fruit of the spirit in Galatians 5 that is also being filled with the spirit uh, demonstrating patience love joy peace kindness gentleness kindness long-suffering um, the fruit that we know that can only testify of the Holy Spirit but this filling here in Ephesians 5 18 is talking about spiritual maturity and growth and exhibiting that. And when we look at this in context, when we see the excesses of the world being outlined versus there is no excess in focusing on Christ, there's no such thing as glorifying Christ too much. <laughs> there is no such thing as glorifying Christ too much when it's biblical and it's in the context and of what the Holy Spirit has outlined through scripture for us to understand and know the instruction that's there that's given to us and knowing how to do that and then testifying of Christ by the Spirit in our lives every day and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ above all things and proclaiming the gospel by the way is not just being nice to people it's actually saying what the gospel is which is repent and believe and turn from your sin so that the wrath of God no longer abides on you and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior so that you can have the promise of eternal life that he paid for and satisfied the wrath of God on your behalf. That's the full gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ centered all around that. And we can also look at Colossians 3.16. I mentioned that. It says to, to let the word of Christ dwell richly within you. So this goes hand in hand with this. When you are um, submitted to the word of God and you're letting it dwell in you richly, that you are cultivating that fellowship slash intimacy with God. Reading the word of God and having it dwell richly within you is part of your intimacy with God. So we are not to diminish the role of Christ and to bring him down to our level, but we are to to, uh, continue to exalt him in the place that he is because he is God. This is support that you are to act in a godly way, that you are to act in a spiritually mature way that indicates that you are growing and that this can only be done by the filling, the continual filling of the Holy Spirit in your life continual feeling that this continues to take place and that you're submitting yourself to the word of God. You're submitting yourself to other believers for reverencing Christ, as it says in verse 21, that you are worshiping God, that you're not forsaking the gathering of the assembly. You're staying in the word of God. You're having the word of Christ dwell in you richly. You're glorifying God. You're proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's not based on your works. You're resting in Christ and you're trusting him all along the way, knowing that he has paid the price for you. It is finished and that you are just made for good works for him to glorify him, not to save you, but you're made for good works to glorify him. No, that's been a long podcast, but this has been uh, one that's very passionate for me. And again, if you have any questions, you are more than welcome to email me at, uh, at info at lovesubscribe.com. You can message me on Facebook if you'd like um, to, to say, ask any questions or anything. But I just want to make it clear here again today. This whole podcast has been, I just want, I'm just reiterating this so that way it's heard several different times through this whole episode. This podcast has been about talking about what does it look like to be spirit filled and does that always equate to tongues? And the answer is no. You do not have to speak in tongues in order to be spirit filled. It's a continual process of growing in Christ and and growing in maturity and being empowered for the work of service, which is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to for those that are to hear and to see and 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 believe. And God is the one that knows those that when they're watered, that someone's going to come along and continue to to be watered or that someone's going to plant the seed someone else is going to cut water but God is going to get the increase he gets the glory it's his work that's done we just simply obey as servants of Christ and that we are always glorifying him in all that we do in word and deed I bless you guys today thank you so much for listening I look forward to being on here with you next week be blessed thank you for joining me on this podcast If you would like to connect with me, you can find me on Facebook and on Instagram at lovesickscribe, 
And if you enjoy reading, feel free to hop on over to lovesickscribe.com and subscribe to my blog. I've enjoyed being with you today, and I look forward to our next time together as we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and we continue to grow together in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. Blessings to you. 